it's me today. So I um because we have the two weeks per chapter, I only did the first three sections. Chapter ten. Okay. Um so didn't put any learning objectives, but okay. Um in the first three sections, there was not a lot of new Julia code that I could see. They use this um well, they explicitly said in the book that this was maybe a different type of function than we've seen. They have this in place style of function modifying the input so they don't have a return. Um, then they use this function each row. I just copied this from the help page. So if you have a matrix, um, it creates this object that essentially stores each row um, as its own vector that you can access. And then um, the third section of the book is about differentiation matrices. So they introduce a bunch of functions. Well, two, I should say that prefix with diff and then they return these difference matrices. Okay. So the first section um, is about defining the two point boundary value problem. So a boundary value problem is a system where the state is not entirely given at any point. Um, so this is contrary to the initial value problem right, where the state is entirely defined um, at the initial point. But you have partial information at multiple values of the independent variable. This is usually the boundary of the variable. So the two point boundary value problem, some qualities, right? The independent variable. So um, in this section that we use X, where in the initial value problem, a lot of time we use T. Um, so X is bounded or it's implied to be bounded based on the set of equations. We have um, several functions. So we have a function of dependent and so of the dependent variable and the dependent variable derivative at the boundary points are zero. And these are the boundary conditions. They refer to it as the functions um, G1 and G2. Uh, and so then some conceptualization of these problems. So in an inverse initial value problem, um, this is like thinking about things in time. So you start at an initial value, and then the system determines the future course of the state. Um, so you can think about that as sort of time, things evolving in time. In the boundary value problem, um, they say you can think about it more like a spatial domain. Um, so where your spatial domain is bounded and then the information at certain points sort of spreads across the domain. Um, then they introduce some specific classes of G1 and G2 that have these certain names. So Dirichlet, Newman, and Robin. And these were like specific um, you know, identity plus minus a constant, I think, plus a constant and then something else. Um, and these problems can be linear or nonlinear in those. That classification is what you um, would expect it to be. Okay, so I have this demo from this section. So the way we numerically work with these, oh, there we go, it's better. Boundary value problem. So this is a two, two, I don't remember now, but anyway. Two points, <laughs> two points. Yeah, two point boundary value problem. <laughs> and so we recast it as the initial value problem by specifying a two dimensional state where, and this chapter is a little bit weird because some of the stuff in 10.1 depends on stuff in 10.2. Um, so if you skip ahead to 10.2, you redefine the state to be two dimensional where the first dimension is the function, the dependent function u was usually what they called it. And then the second state is the derivative, the first derivative. Okay. Um, so this is the boundary value problem based on the, um, the circular disks, I believe. 
So R was the radius. Uh, and so this is defining, this is what I was talking about, function defining. Um, there's no return. So you can see our first argument F is modified in place uh, by these two statements. So this function um, will modify F and it will be modified globally. Okay. So this is where right, F, the first part of the state um, is, and the second, I don't remember actually. Anyway, so this is the system the of equations, the dynamic system, or I guess it's not dynamic, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> um, and then the differential equation, that would be, there we go. And then these are the two boundary conditions, G1 and G2. So again, this is that same um, in place modification of G. So we don't have a return, it's just not gonna modify G. Okay. The domain um, is zero to one for this disk. And we, since we don't have an initial value, but we're going to use initial value problem tools to solve it, we need to give a guess of the initial value. So this is saying at um, x is zero, we expect the dependent variable to be one and that the derivative to be zero at, at zero. Okay, uh, we define this boundary value problem and this is really small here, but, oh. I don't know if I can, how much I can zoom in. Um, so these are two solutions. Um, what happened here? Oh, this is the function and the derivative. I think something happened with my copying and pasting or typing. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we have the function and the function derivative for one guess of the initial value. Okay. The next section, I have some exercises I put at the end, so I'll do that at the end. Uh, the next se section then says, okay, you, in order to solve as an initial value problem, you have to guess what the initial value is. Well, usually your guess might not be that great. So you could do trial and error guessing of the initial values and see, um, I just guess, just inspect it and see which one come close to the boundary conditions. Um, or you can use this shooting method where essentially your initial value is a shot and you can use um, the information about how much you missed, say like the basket and basketball to adjust, right? Maybe you overshot, undershot, you then you can use that to change your initial value. I don't really go into a lot be beyond that, just conceptually what it means. Um, and they give us a function to do it. So here's the same, this disk problem. Um, this is a trial and error. So for different estimates of the initial value for the function, so not that the derivative is going to be fixed at zero. Um, and we're going to try different initial values for the function. We solve it with our initial value problem. And then our boundary condition was that the um, function at x equals 1 needs to be 1. OK, so here. Right, we see here, uh, this says t at one. We want to inspect, you know, which one of these initial values actually goes to one here. So the closest one in this example, uh, I know it's annoying when I zoom in and, <laughs> and talk, um, is this gold one. So for this grid of values, right, our best guess is 0.8. Okay, but this is just on a grid, we can use um, information to adjust it adaptively. Okay, so does that all make sense so far? Okay. Um, and that's the shooting method. They don't really, as far as I could tell, they didn't really tell like how it 
adapts. Um, but then um, they discuss the instability of the shooting method. Essentially, you have the two boundary points. Um, the accuracy is not symmetric at both boundary points. Uh, it's generally more very accurate, I think, at the first one and then only a little bit accurate at the second one, I think is what they said. Um, and yeah, this was a demo about the instability. And yeah, I didn't get this to work right. Let me zoom in. I'll pull up the book to show you what they said. They had their functions like doing something crazy where on my machine, they all go to one here. Maybe I didn't copy it right. So let me show you what we were supposed to see. Um, we were supposed to see something like um, this. So you see at the first boundary value at zero, right there, all where they should be. Uh, minus one. Over here, again, um, we wanted it to be at zero. This is a different set of equations, sorry. Um, so the function should be minus one at zero and zero at one. So you can see here at one, um, they kind of, this is the instability. These are all sort of missing. And this is determined by a value of the parameter of um, the system, this lambda. So that's a specification of the system. That's not really a part of the algorithm. And when you did it, it actually worked for all the lambdas. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, I don't know if I um, copy and paste. I'm pretty sure I just copied this, but <laughs> it works for all of them. Um, yeah. Interesting. I actually should look really quick. I thought I just copied it, but. Oh, the line lambda square times u plus one. There should be a, an asterisk or I don't know if that, that meant. No. Oh, yeah, okay. Maybe, maybe. But sometimes Julia just takes a space to be multiplied or. But yeah. Otherwise, otherwise what does it going to think? It's two, the function, it should give an error, right? Two thinks the function of the two is a function, uh, as a function or something. Yeah. I'll change it on my. I won't have time to rerun it um, during the call, but I can change it mm -hmm. here. Um, for the, I, I don't quite understand the rules for when it's okay to leave out the star. And... <laughs> yeah, I don't either. <laughs> My habit is just to put them in, so. Yeah. Better to be explicit, right? Wait, I wonder if it binds differently. I shouldn't. But your solutions um... kind of look the same. Oh, no, not really. Yeah, your solutions do look different too, so. Yeah. I mean, yeah. At the, not just at the boundary, but also earlier. Oh, wait, I can, I can run it in here. Yeah, so the star, the asterisk is required, I think. Yeah. But it's not an error if you don't have it? It seems weird. Yeah, because it will exponentially, it, it's sort of like it would. Oh. Uh, exponentiate the two times u plus one. Maybe. Okay, here okay. we go. Yes, there. that was the error. There, that worked so it, out. It'll bind tighter if, it, if it's space is what you're saying? That's weird. Oh, yeah, if I, I guess, don't have the asterisk, this is all of the exponent, is that what you mean? Yeah, if, I think so, if, without the space. But if, if there's a space in between two and u plus one, 
then I guess that, that would be the same as with, with the asterisk. I, mean, I think yeah. you wrote that kind of thing in Python or, or R, you just get an error, right? It's like, oh, two is not a function <laughs> or something. Oh, yeah. R would be like, two is not, yeah, not a function or something. <laughs> not closure. Seen that before. Type whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. Not type closure. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be okay, cryptic like that. Solve that one. Great. Solve that one. <laughs> All right. It's funny because okay, so, I, I also noticed the star. I'm like, oh, but it's okay, Julia. So I didn't say anything. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> but that was it. Um, that's not a, okay. I don't know. That's not the greatest behavior. Yeah. I don't I'm not sure if I'm a fan of the old space means something. I mean it looks nice for mathematical notation, but you can see how it gets you in trouble because that's a common thing, a typo, and it doesn't air out. You're like, oh, what's going on? You have to hunt around. <laughs> yeah, exactly what just happened to me. Like, yeah, <laughs> it works. Yeah. Um. Okay, and I haven't read the second half of the chapter yet, so I'm not quite sure how this is. Um, all these sections come together. Now I have a typo right here. Um, because the next section, ten point three, is sort of. Well, I guess it we're probably getting to different methods for solving the boundary value problem. So in our journey to get to those new methods, um, we have a section on differentiation matrices. So before in chapter five, we talked about finite differencing for derivative estimation at one point where we had the tables of the coefficients for different orders and forward differencing, backward differencing, you know, all these centered, first order, second order, yada, yada. Now we're going, we're defining finite differencing matrices. So essentially it's just, um, you have the matrix of those coefficients we talked about that give the derivative estimate for the vector of the discrete um, function evaluations at the nodes. Okay, so we're now in matrix vector um, multiplication. And so if you've done this before, I mean, this comes up a lot, like in time series, um, you have to have special considerations for the boundary cases where you don't, so say, for example, you're doing centering in all of the interior nodes on the boundaries, you don't have points, you know, to before or after. So you have to do different coefficients with the same um, degree. They didn't really say this, but um, they specified they just kept the same degree of order um, for the boundaries. They just used um, maybe non-centered coefficients. Okay. Um, the other, oh, there was something else in here. Oh, sorry. Uh, so that was for, that's finite differencing, right? We talked about before that uses local coefficients for just points around to estimate the derivative at the point. Um, I believe that Ron did this chapter nine. Um, you can right. also, yeah, do global interpolation, right? Meaning that the um, estimate at one point depends on information from all of the nodes in the set. Okay, not just local, but global. Um, and for a function f, you can get this convergent spectral convergence, which means it converges linearly on a log linear versus algebraic is the log log or some of the, you know, all those discussions we had before. Um, if f has infinitely many derivatives on the interval, and if f has infinitely many derivatives, so does f's derivative. So the spectral convergence is for all the orders of different the differentiation. Um, so the Chebyshev, so the finite difference matrices are not dense, they have a lot of zeros. Um, but the Chebyshev differentiating matrix is a dense matrix, and then you can just use these formulas to calculate your entries, where n is how many nodes minus one, I think, because it starts with zero. 
So um, yeah, you have zero zero is the first zero is the first node, and n is um, I don't know. I guess they started with zero here too. But regardless, remember we're starting with zero. Okay. Um, so this is one demo. Let me make sure I think I skipped something. Oh yeah, wait, did I? Sorry, what's happening here? Um. I don't really know. It's fine, I can just show it in the book, but... Um, probably missing a space or something in my okay so this is one demo that I was going to show um, I wanted to show these matrices let me just go in here okay so one second Okay. Okay. So we have um, this function diff matrix second order will give you all the coefficients you need to have second order accuracy for first derivatives um, on a set of 18 nodes in the interval minus one to one. So D X, um, if you remember our table, right? So this is centered differencing of degree two. This is the boundary because at the first node, you don't have a value. I'm gonna refer to time here. You don't have a value in the past. So we take the current and two future to get second order accuracy. Um, and then these are centered, right? Just the average of the one before and after. The second derivative, um, there wasn't a table, uh, but you, the, you derive the coefficients from using the um, theorem of what, whatever it's called, <laughs> uh, fundamental. No, I don't know. You know, where you do, you subtract the um, functions divided by the, what's that called? I don't know. Um, so you don't, what, what they mentioned though, is you don't um, do the derivative squared. You, you derive out the um, polynomial and you get these sort of coefficients. Again, um, I don't know how they decided um, whether to be centered or forward or backward, et cetera. Um, but these are the coefficients. And these are divided now by the, these are divided by the spacing in the nodes. And these are divided by the spacing in the node squared. Um, and that's why we have these magnitudes the way that they are. Um, yeah. OK. Okay, that's basically what I wanted to say about that. Um, so then they have the equivalent function for Chebyshev matrices. Um, so again, now these are dense, so you'll see, so we only have three nodes. Sorry, we have N is three, so zero to three. We have a four by four matrix. We have a dense matrix, meaning there's no non-zero elements um, using those. Chebyshev, the formulas I just showed, this is the same uh, function. And here, the convergence of the first and second derivative is linear and we have um, log of the error, but normal. The number of nodes is um, at, at scale. Okay, so 
This is the spectral convergence, linear in log linear. And uh, if we go back to the other demo, this one has algebraic convergence because it's linear in log log. Okay. Okay, and then it's second order. I believe that was the um, slope of these lines or something like that. Okay. So, are there any comments on the content? It was not a lot. It was very sparse content. <laughs> um, any? Oh, Ron, Ron, you're, muted. Ron you're muted. If I'm, if I remember correctly from the reading, I, I think the idea is that we're going to take these big matrices and then re-express the boundary value problem as a big linear algebra problem, right? <laughs> yeah. That, or a non-linear algebra problem, as the case may be, but yeah, the, that's where I think it'll head to because we'll evaluate it from discretizing the space in some way. Um, okay, so I have some exercises. Like I said, the way the book was written was a little weird. Um, this is actually exercise ten point one and ten point two three together. Uh, 10.1 introduces this allen Kahn equation for phase changes in one dimension. So example, a phase change from liquid to solid. And um, we have here this epsilon parameter. Okay. Um, and the boundary uh, is between zero and one, and these are our boundary conditions. Okay. And so it was weird because the exercise in 10.1 was said, solve this exercise using a function introduced in 10.2. <laughs> oh, that's so. <laughs> uh, yeah, Use function 10.2.2, which is, what is that? Oh, the shoot. So, yeah. It said, use the shoot function um, with these specified initial conditions. So these are our guesses for the initial condition. Um, technically, we have this initial condition known. Um, well, this know one, here, right? no, but they give us this. So this says. What the derivatives, yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, and then we're gonna solve it for decreasing values of epsilon and plot the solution. And then in 10.2.3, they ask to calculate the difference in the derivative at the boundary points. Mm. So I've done it all together in one. Um, most of this is just repeated from the demos. I didn't really get creative with the code. Um, I did, I'm not, um worked with these problems before uh, so it did take me a little while to realize when you specify g1 and g2 you have to take these equations and make them zero on one side yeah. <laughs> okay <laughs> i wonder if there's a typo i mean i don't want to interrupt you but i wonder if there's a typo because if you look at the text for 10.2.3 it basically repeats everything even though it says continuation then it just says everything all over again Right. We, so I think they must have made wanted to you to use the uh, BBP uh, function. You know what oh. I mean? Probably to solve it using the the Julia um, thing, the BBP yeah. problem. Okay. BBP problem. I mean, yeah. I'm guessing yeah, that's what the I problem. Maybe I can do that for next time. <laughs> you already did it the um, hard way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. This first boundary condition translates to u plus one equals zero. This one, u minus one equals zero. So these are, I think, Dirichlet and some of those special names we learned. Um, okay, and then we just need to call the f and c shoot. You Dirichlet, yeah. have, have to define phi 
with all three of these, with three inputs, they don't have to have these names, um, but I think I was having, actually, I don't know. When I wasn't getting it to work, I was trying different things. So I don't know if you can describe, define fee with fewer arguments, um, but okay. So the first argument is fee, the system, which is the second derivative. Um, the boundary, or sorry, the um, interval that the dependent variable um, is defined in, g1, g2, and then the initial values. Okay. Um, I have them all plotted together. Oh, this didn't show, but this is like 0.04. I don't know why it didn't show. I can look up the number, but I didn't get anything different for any of these epsilons. Okay, and then you just change epsilon and recall the function. I plotted them all on top of each other. Yeah, it's starting to look more steppy. And so, yeah, the green one is the epsilon. So as it goes to zero, yeah, you get more of a step function. The second part of C says try different initial values. Um, and which ones do you think are better? I think this is kind of a <laughs> setup for failure if you don't know these systems because this system, um, they even warn you like it's not numerically stable. So I was just trying some different initial values and they were not even like physically, maybe, I don't know, they didn't really so first I tried different values for um the state I didn't run this because it didn't really make any sense it started to be like a curve like a sine curve wavy didn't make any sense um then I tried to change the initial value for the derivative I tried to do a grid again and um it I it was like error non-singular, et cetera, et cetera. I found that if I tried very small values, um, I could get solutions. And then you can see here what that looks like. So um, these two, orange and green, um, they jump up sooner and then they, they don't quite meet the boundary oh. condition here. Undershoot it a little bit. Um, this is the machine epsilon, the purple one, and it's just to the left a little bit of the blue, of putting zero. So I guess the true function, yeah, a step function. So it would probably, I don't know where it's supposed to jump actually, if it's supposed to jump at a half. You think out of half because it be, should be symmetrical, right? Oh, yeah, because it said it's symmetric. So I guess if you could get closer to exactly zero. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not sure. It would be interesting here. to see what the uh, what the BB problem gives for it. Eh? Mm. Mm hmm Yeah. I'll have to do that. Maybe for next time. Um, or maybe after. I, we could probably do it because we'll have some time. Are there any other comments on this? All right, I'm going to turn on my lights. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did anyone try any other exercises in these two sections? I didn't get to any of them. I just been swamped, so. No worries. You've done a lot, okay. which I appreciate. I tried to <laughs> choose like the most challenging ones so yeah. that we could have some discussion. Uh, but on the next one, I kind of just gave up. 
Um, oh, sorry. Not this one, not this one. I can show the value. I didn't get anything different. So in 10.3, it says to rewrite the difference matrix to function to have fourth order accurate uh, accuracy um, for both the derivative and the second derivative. It suggests using this FD weights function from chapter five. Um, and this one I was, I'll, I'll just talk through how I did it. Let me do side by side really quick. Come on. Work with me, computer. <laughs> Probably have too many things open. Okay, let me go back to chapter five. So, my strategy was at least for the derivative, I just, for the interior points, I just chose this fourth or order set of coefficients. Um, so that's here. Uh, I, I didn't change the name yet, but so this is setting up the nodes to be equally spaced between um, A and B. So you specify how many nodes you want and the um, boundaries. This is the strategy they used for the um, if matrix two was first to fill in the diagonals and then to deal with the boundaries. So here I have, um, yeah, these, this row here, one twelfth minus two thirds, zero, two thirds minus one twelfth. Um, and then the boundaries are at, zero, one, n minus one and n, which are these row these in indices. Um, this is where I try to use the FD weights. Um, I don't know. I think you could just use these one sided, like forward differencing. I don't know. I was actually a little confused by their hint to use this FD weights. Yeah. To be honest, I think you can use this um, forward or backward differencing um, instead. But here. I used the FD weights. You need to subset the nodes to just be the local nodes for these indices. And you need to make it zero at the index of interest. And then this just means first derivative. So this says my local nodes for, you know, the first node or the first five minus the first one. That's the one of interest. Um, and then I tried to do it you know, that, I don't know, per, concisely by doing the first two boundaries and the last two together. Um, that's where I got, I didn't get to the second derivative because I wasn't sure from this book that we don't get a table for the second derivative, so... <laughs> I wasn't sure um, if I should just use FD weights. I hadn't decided, I guess. Um, as I, a pro I, like if I was a programmer and this was my task, I didn't decide whether I was going to, um, you know, derive a fourth order equation like this or use FD weights. I don't. I know. think FD FD weights allows you to do higher order derivatives, right? Without without actually yeah. hard coding the coefficients of the of the for f right mm -hmm. yeah i guess um i guess yeah you could i i could get the weights oh yeah it does the interior yeah. you can put whatever whatever order you want 
Yeah. So I could do the same strategy um, for the interior, do the diagonals, and then do it again for the boundaries. Yeah, I, I, I think I think we're gonna see this again in chap in the next chapter. Uh, where you're gonna be using differentiation matrices again. So we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Okay. I'll fin yeah finish that as well. Um, let's. We got a little bit of time. Let me go in the. Um, that's all I did. Um, for today so, so how do you so wait a minute i'm still confused by that so how do you so fd weights will give you what is just the one-sided forward and backward one is that what they do it's um I'm not, i don't remember what fd weights does exactly. it's this it gives you the these uh oh okay ornberg so it's the so it's not local in any way. It's then. like a recursive, a recursive formula for getting weights, and just arbitrary. Um, and I think the order, right? Like, so this is fourth order because I have five points. Or something. I don't know. That's the part I was like confused about. Maybe I only need four points here. Maybe this is higher order. Let me look at these tables. Oh, I see. You can specify any point, centered, order. whatever you want. That's pretty cool. Does it give the same answers if yeah. you like? If you do specify, like, you know, just equally spaced points as you would get in that in that table. I wonder. I guess I don't remember this mm -hmm. chapter that well already. <laughs> what was this? Two years ago? When did we go? <laughs> Wow. Who even presented this one? <laughs> yeah, I, I I did present that one. And, okay. Uh, and I let me let me just show you. Let me drop off the the link, so in the chat. Okay. Do you want to share a screen? Uh, just so just a moment. Sorry. Uh, I can stop sharing. Uh, if I see my stop share. Oh, okay. Yeah, interesting. Okay, cool. Yeah, so if you look at the, so 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 the exercise, the related exercise is five point four point four, and I guess I guess there's a, I think the assumption is that you could, you have these node vectors that you could specify, and it, I think they are the centered ones, uh, and um, in the next slide you could see. Sort of like the yeah, That's but this okay. is the second derivative. This this exercise is where the second derivative. Yeah, right. But you can see yeah. they're producing the same numbers that they were using. Yeah, they mm -hmm. look familiar anyway. The five sixty three fifteen, and I suppose if you, you want it to be zero at the point that you're trying to, um, like calculate gives, the function. Yeah, the derivative, gives a derivative at. at zero. Yeah. yeah. So if you put in like rational zero to r. Instead, you would get an off-centered one, I presume, right? And a forward or forward difference or whatever, or backward difference. Yeah. Interesting. I think so, yeah. Wow, that's uh, very hazy in my memory. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Otherwise, you do it the old-fashioned way, you know, you... You uh, so when I presented this, it's like you you interpolate first, no, and then you differentiate, and then yeah. do a lot of algebra, uh, nasty algebra. Right. Oh yeah, I do remember that. So that's right. So that's what I took away from them. Like, okay, good. I believe I'll believe Fornberg and uh, that. Was <laughs> <laughs> Presumably, Why they're not? right. right? <laughs> yeah. All right. Otherwise, the, this whole enterprise is a house of cards, you know? <laughs> it really does seem to be getting that way, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some things you thought we'd never have to think about again came right back. Oh, man. <laughs> 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 he waits. Global function. Well, we just did that, but. Um, let me.
Uh, should I stop? I think I should stop the screen. So there. Yeah. I, 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 I guess that's the I guess that's the disadvantage of the of this kind of book club where you you know you take turns. It's gonna be hard to have this kind of continuity. You break continuity in some way, and uh, mm -hmm. if chapters rely on other chapters, and you know. Well, I mean, we're all supposed to be reading the chapters, yeah. doing exercises. But, <laughs> I, mean, I think we tend to be a little more lax when it's not our turn, always, and that's always the case, by the way, in any subject. That's right. right? So they always that's say, if you want to learn something, you should teach it, right? So that's always yeah. the truth. Yeah. But I think this is tougher in the sense that you, we also have to do some some mathematics along the way. So it's yeah, a, yeah. yeah. The dog. And the Julia thing is sort of like scattered all over the place, and yeah. then you know. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean I think that this was a good exercise to go through this book, but I. I like you said, I think Andrew said earlier, I don't think anyone else is going to probably follow our footsteps. <laughs> this, this is the <laughs> one and only cohort. <laughs> probably. <laughs> because the, the main goal was just to have a good, I, for me, the kind of the main goal was the Julia part, not necessarily the numerical computation part, although I think it's important to learn these things, but it's almost like, you yeah. know, taking your medicine. Put, put <laughs> in here. 